All right, we talked last week about Anson Carter leading a group to bring an NHL team to Alpharetta, Georgia. We like the idea of this, and we want it to work. We want hockey to thrive in Atlanta. So let's bring in an Atlanta hockey legend, former thrasher, former Stanley Cup champion, current, whatever, he has a Stanley Cup for the rest of his life. That ring is not going anywhere. And current Stars Director of Player Personnel, Rich Peverly. Rich, it has been a thousand years. It's so good to talk to you. How are you, man? I'm good. How are you guys? Outstanding. Great. Outstanding. Uh, what was it like playing in Atlanta? You've played in a few different markets, uh, Nashville, Boston, Dallas. What's Atlanta like as a hockey market? I, I think it could work. Um, I think Atlanta had a lot of, uh, a lot of transplants. Uh, a lot of people from the north, you know, you're talking Buffalo was a big one, uh, Boston, New York. I, I think it could work. I, I, I really like the, the city. It's a big city. There's a lot of people that live around the outskirts that uh, really enjoy hockey. And, I, you know, I, I think it could work. It hasn't worked the previous two times that it's that it's been there. What do you think is like the number one thing that is necessary for it to stick this time? Well, I, I do think that arena location is huge. Um, the city, you know, I don't know the city as much anymore as when I lived there, but, you know, I, I do remember going to Braves games and they weren't getting 10,000 people at the, at the stadium. And, you know, they switched that, or they switched that stadium up, up into, I think it's in Marietta or Alpharetta. And, you know, they're doing really well from what I hear. I, I check uh, box scores. I look at, I'm, I'm curious on that stuff and I check on the attendance and they do well. And obviously the teams had success. So I do think arena location is everything. Um, not to say that downtown Atlanta isn't a great spot. I just think you got to go where the fan base is. Did they do enough while you were like, did, did it feel Atlanta enough? Like there, there were, there was like the Peverly hillbilly and there were like certain Southern elements that were worked in there, but did it feel like a hockey team in Atlanta or did it feel like, a, a, an operation that was kind of just like moved to Atlanta and trying to like implant something that could be in Toronto or Boston or whatever, and like forced into this Southern area. I, I think it, you know, I think it obviously had its hardcore fans. Um, you know, I, I look at what Dallas has done over the years and, and what they've done is they've built arenas all over the city. And I, I can't name the amount they have. I'm going to guess eight to 10 duplexes all over the city. And that's where you got to build the grassroots for the kids. And, you know, you got to bring it up. And those are your future audiences, is, is young kids. So in Atlanta, I don't think they did that. Um, I can only really remember the old, the practice arena in Duluth. And that was it for hockey arenas in Atlanta. And maybe there was a couple others. We just never saw them. So like I said, in Dallas, it, from where the practice facility is for the Stars, within a half an hour, you have four or five uh, twin ice pads and they're sold out every day and they could get more and more people onto those ice pads if they built more. So, you know, I think that's a really big uh, thing that they're going to have to do. I think they've done that in Vegas, um, but you got to continue to build more, more ice rinks to be able to bring more fans in. We talk a lot about like the branding of NHL teams here, and we've discussed like whether or not we'd want the thrashers to be revived as a former thrasher. Do you have an opinion on whether you'd want to see, a revival of the Thrashers uh, franchise or see them kind of start fresh in Atlanta? Um, that's a tough question. I, you know, there, I don't think the team had a lot of success. Obviously we know it didn't have a lot of success. They never won a playoff game. I think that a new, a new name wouldn't hurt. Um, you know, you're starting fresh. Maybe it's, uh, you know, obviously with the expansion process now, Atlanta's going to get, if they do do it, uh, is going to get a lot better team. Uh, I think that's why we've seen success in Seattle and in Vegas is, you know, every team is going to lose a really good player. Um, so if they do that, and, and I think that's part and parcel why it didn't work in Atlanta is just the lack of success. The, the expansion process 20 years ago when those teams were coming in, like they weren't winning games at all. And, and if you want to have fans and you're going to have to win games. So I think that comes down to it. It's kind of wild that like the the lack of success when you think about how many great players did wear the Thrashers uniform. It's like it's it is wild to think back about how many like really really great players the Thrashers had, yourself included. 
Well, no, I think you're talking about <laughs> Hall of Famers there, not myself. You know, you got Hosa and Kovalchuk and Danny Healy. There's some pretty good players that played there, and I'm not, you know, Mark Recchi played there. There's some some good players played in Atlanta. No, nah, man, I was telling our producer before the show, like, dream player, Rich Peverly. Play all three forward positions, PK, power play, just, I mean, the year you won a cup, you lose a first liner, you jump up onto the first line. Hell of a player, unbelievable career. Uh, what was the weirdest thing that you experienced in Atlanta of like, what is this? Like, how am I, like, how is hockey happening here sort of thing? The weirdest thing? There wasn't a ton of weird things. I, 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 I just, you know, you show up for an important game and there might be 5,000 people. And, and, and I say that, you know, I better be careful in saying that, but it really wasn't enjoyable when you're going to go play a game and it's a meaningful game and you're not getting any fans. So, you know, that is that the weirdest thing? No, that's not the weirdest thing. There's obviously living in the South. I've lived in Nashville and Dallas and, and there's different uh, fans that are, you know, they grew up differently than people in the North or people in Canada. And, you know, I, I can't think of anything off the top of my head that was crazy, but uh, you know, Atlanta was still a fun place to play. It's a good city. So what was it like then being on the team? Because you, you played three years there, but you were also there the team's final year. So you got traded during that season. Was it weird or less weird because you're like, we all end up having to leave here anyway? It kind of hit everyone, like, shockingly, I think. Uh, you know, for myself, obviously, I, I remember being in a hotel room and maybe conference finals uh, and we were all playing cards the night before a game and it just kind of popped up on ESPN during, you know, it wasn't ESPN. It would have been versus or something like that during the playoffs. We were watching a game on the screen and it just kind of popped up and they're like, we're moving, they're moving to Winnipeg. And I didn't, you had not heard any rumors. Not like you'd hear now with Arizona possibly moving to Utah you, you know, so the NHL did a good job of covering it up or, and, and not really, you know, showing any any details or any leaks. So, you know, it was a good job by them on that side of it. But it was surprising. Like, you know, I guess I didn't have to stay in Atlanta, but, you know, I got to move to one of the best cities in the NHL. So I couldn't be, you know, I was happy. So I did want to ask you some uh, about the stars, uh, specifically one of the guys that is near and dear to my heart this year, Logan Stankoven, because as a, a short person, a proud short person, I have to root for the short guys. What have you seen from Logan Stankoven? Obviously came in as a pretty highly touted prospect, but what have you seen from him in the early returns with the Stars? He's been excellent. Scored again last night. Um, you know, we've been watching him. Obviously, our owner, uh, Tom Glardy, owns the Kamloops Blazers. We're... Uh, where Logan is from and played for his hometown team. So he had obviously some really good history with the player and the person and fantastic kid, highly motivated, uh, no maintenance player, no maintenance kid. He is dialed in and he wants to be a good hockey player. And he's had everyone guessing him the whole, all the time, all throughout his career. He's, he's five, eight, but he is built strong and he's thick. And you rarely see him get knocked down. I think that's the biggest thing. You go into hard games. Is it World Juniors? Is it WHL uh, Conference Finals? Is it, you know, any big game? He's getting knocked all over the place and he's not falling over. He just, yeah. he stands on his feet. He's got great balance and he goes to the hard areas. And that's why he scores. You know, he's got a heck, heck of a shot. It's really heavy, but, you know, he goes to the hard areas of the ice and he scores goals. And, you know, that's what you got to do to score in the NHL. And he's doing it. Yeah, I'm glad you you pointed that out because like in his first two games, that was what jumped out to me is that like here's this five eight kid playing in his first couple of NHL games. He's scoring goals directly in front of the net. Seems like a very smart and very fearless player, and I'm excited to see where he goes. Uh, the the thing about the stars for me is that like the, the what I like the most about that group is that it is like a mixture of the past the present and the future all contributing to the success of that team. What's the dynamic like uh, for that group when the core is such a wide ranging group? Well, I think, you know, it all starts with, with Jamie Ben and, and Joel and, and Joel Pavelski, you know, you're talking about some pretty well, uh, 
well, good veterans that have been around a long time. They know how to win. They've been to the, the, the long playoff runs. They've been through the grind of the season. You know, you couple that with, you know, you have some young players that want to get better. And is it Logan Stein Colvin or is it Wyatt Johnson, like 18, 19, 20-year-old players that, you know, they're just willing to learn as much as possible. And, you know, Tyler's been in awesome this year. He's been excellent playing on a line with Matt Duchesne. And, you know, you have kind of that group with Marchment and Sagan. And then you still have Jason Robertson, Rope Hintz, and kind of in their mid-20s. And those are guys that, again, those are guys that were second-round picks that, you know, it wasn't an easy path. And they didn't go straight to the NHL. They, they both played in the American League a full season. And, you know, I think uh, the development side of our of our group, plus with the drafting, like, you know, we, our, Joe McDonnell and our, and our group of scouts have done a fantastic job. And the development side, you know, including the AHL coaches, have been excellent at, you know, making these guys good pros and, and wanting to win wanting to win and wanting to learn how to win and do it the right way. How do you like doing the, the it's it sounds like you really like doing the front office thing. Yeah, I, I really like it. It's uh, you know I you know obviously with my career stopped early. I was I think I was only like thirty one or thirty two and you know I've been doing this now for, for nine years. So it's crazy that it's been nine, ten years doing this job. But uh I love this side of it. It's a lot of fun. I, you know, when you win a cup, I talked to Gregory Campbell about this. When you win a cup, uh, it's it's an unbelievable feeling. You're part of a group and, you know, you have that forever. And I just want to do it again. And if I can do it on this side of it, it's, uh, you know, it probably won't mean as much, but it's going to mean in a, a lot in a different way. You mentioned uh, Campbell. Uh, I saw rumors the other day about, like, does Chris Kelly become the head coach of the Senators, which obviously at some point that's going to happen because Chris Kelly and the Senators just can't uh, keep their hands off each other. But like what it was all, all those 2011 guys, like you just keep hearing more and more things about like just their aptitude. What, what was it about that, that group? Do you think? I never met a group that was so motivated um, to get better at everything in life. You know, you're talking some fantastic people, but like the hardest working people I've ever met, my, like Zdeno and Patrice, Brad, uh, Dennis Seidenberg, Gregory Campbell, uh, you know, the list, I could name every single guy on that team and they brought something to the table that outworked someone else. And, you know, I think with Gregory, like he was always one of the most in shape people. He's, you know, obviously with his dad tied to the NHL, he's, uh, he's got an insight there and, you know, he's done a great job in Florida, obviously look at what they've done. Um, but even, you know, Sean Thornton, he, he, he works hard at what he does, but he's not on the hockey side of it. Right. But he's still around the team, around the team. And, you know, I just, I, I couldn't, I couldn't probably say enough accolades about every single guy on that team and how hard they worked and how much it changed me as a person. And I tell those guys like, you know, Berge and Zidano and, and everyone, and Chris Kelly in that group of, you know, I just learned how to work harder and be, uh, you know, be a hard, be a hard working person at all times. And I think that's what kind of helped me, you know, have a little bit more success. I saw Sean Thornton in Toronto at the all-star game and you, you're, uh, he was like the type of guy that <laughs> could like shove you in the locker. But even now he's just such an adult, like everybody that there was just always this, like, I don't want to say professionalism because that makes you sound like a bunch of dorks, but like. Truly, everybody <laughs> serious. Everybody like knew when they needed to actually show up. You guys were, uh, you guys were great. Uh, so we have to ask you about the the picture with the the pizza. Do you ever do you ever see yeah. this picture? You and Chara with the pizza. Oh yeah. My, my yeah. understanding is, whenever there were overtime games or any sort of long grueling games, there were tons of pizza boxes in the locker room just because you have to eat during the games and everything. But this is an incredible picture of you and Zdeno Chara. <laughs> Uh, what is this picture? You and Chara having a nice Stanley Cup pizza party. What what does this bring back for you? I just I just remember being like exhausted, and, <laughs> and I don't know if it was the you know was it the game or was it the playoffs. I I just remember the time change and and everything. I just remember I had beer in one hand, I had pizza in one hand, and it was just like. You know, you go through the grueling two months of playing a game every other day, the travel, and it was kind of like, you know, how you get that after a test or after, a, you know, I used to have that feeling after, a, you know, a, um, 
uh, fitness testing when the season when the season was started. I couldn't wait for it to be over with. But this was kind of like it. It was like it's over. We did it, and I was just like, oh, I'm just done. And I just wanted a slice of pizza and a beer. And I was so hungry at the time. I remember it. It was just, uh, you know, one of those feelings that you're just you accomplish something and you just sat back and tried to enjoy it. Well, then not only do you have you have pizza in one hand, beer in the other. And then Zdeno Chara in your lap. Like, <laughs> what was... I think my favorite part of that picture is I'd never noticed it before, but Chara looks spry as the day is young and, like, can go run a marathon and you look like you're ready to go to bed. It's oh. a hilarious juxtaposition. <laughs> I think that's a, probably a good uh, a good uh, lead into the rest of his life, you know, just to what he's been doing and everything. Like, oh, my gosh, the... The marathons, I, you know, you give that guy a lot of credit. He's a highly motivated person. I, I couldn't do that now, but you know, good for him. Does, Does it make you sick? <laughs> Does it make you sick to look at Zidane Char and be like, "What the hell is wrong with this guy? Slow down for he's, one second. He's wired a different way, no question. Well, that's did why you, he did what he did. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but was that like uh, as as a captain? he'd have to be the ultimate lead by example guy because he's just doing impossible things. You mentioned the fitness testing. He would just show up and fuck shit up, just put up these impossible numbers with the pull-ups and everybody trying to uh, catch up to him. But like as a, as a leader, having this impossible standard, does that help or does that make you borderline want to quit? No, no, it, it motivates you to get better, 100%. Like, it, it wasn't... It wasn't just Zidane. There was Dennis Seidenberg. There was Campbell. There was Bergeron. Like Brad was like always in fantastic shape. Like these guys like dialed it in, and and they were in incredible shape. Better than I'd say the top five to seven guys could have been top on other teams. You know, it's just that's how guys were, and that's how motivated they were to be in really good shape. And you know, that's why they became such good players and still are, you know, and talking in Brad's case, still a really good player. Taking, uh, taking Marshawn and Sagan out of it. Who did you see like cut loose the most once you guys won? Oh, uh, I don't know. I don't want to get in trouble here, but <laughs> I, I don't, I don't know. There, I think everybody, like hmm. everybody just had a good time. Like it was, you know, it was a lot of fun. Uh, you know, some guys decided not to drink during the cup, uh, the whole two months, you know, some guys like that just, you know, maybe they hadn't had alcohol in two months. So everyone was kind of going a little bit wild, but, um, you know, everyone just kind of let loose the one couple nights, you know, the parade, everything. It was, uh, it was surreal. It was a great time. I saw an incredible, uh, theory the other day that was, uh, Brad Marchand taught Tyler Sagan how to drink so he could take his spot on the Bruins long term, <laughs> oh which is oh, the most outrageous theory, but would be hilarious if Marshawn was like up to that. He had long con Bruins captain and it all worked out for him. We actually, we had this conversation <laughs> this week. Uh, have you seen like a shift in general behavior amongst NHL players in the way that they carry themselves off the ice in terms of like taking care of your body, not drinking so much, and just like sort of more maintenance rather than like being wild off the ice. Yeah, absolutely. There's no question. Um, you know, you got players that, you know, it's just the way we grew up. Like, like I grew up on weekends, you go to the bar with your friends and that's where you meet and you have a good time. And I don't think it's like that anymore as much. I think, you know, maybe some kids still do that, but they don't do that. They, they go, they're on their phones, they're on social media sites, you know, you know, I, I hate to say it, but you know, maybe there's other things that they're doing instead of drinking now. And, you know, so, you know, kids just have different outlets. And, you know, like I said, everyone used to kind of go and that was the meeting place was go to the bar and meet up and it's kind of changed. Then you, maybe that's led to kids not drinking as much and maybe being more, you know, dialed in on their fitness. But, you know, I also think, when we were playing, we didn't have fitness coaches. We didn't have nutritionists. We didn't have, you know, skills coaches. We didn't have skating coaches. So, you know, kids are regimented now and every kid is like that. And, you know, I can say the same thing. I got young kids and it's kind of going that way, but you got to have a balance. At least I, I believe that. But, you know, I think now with kids, they, they know that 
you know, they're getting coached at a lot younger age. I didn't really get coached. I didn't really have a fitness trainer until I was 25 years old. So, you know, it, it, it it's changed a lot and it's going to continue to change for sure. Well, Rich Peverly, we appreciate you so much for jumping on with us, man. Uh, having a hell of a season in Dallas. They're going to have a pretty deep playoff run, looks like. Uh, continued success, man. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Have a good day. Thanks for having me. All right. Be good, Rich. That's Rich Peverly. What a guy. What a guy. What a legend. What a pizza boy. <laughs> <laughs> we all silly like the mayor. 